it's hard to believe it was over a year ago that I was last here. Um, and in that time, we've had another wee girl, wee Charlotte was born last May. Um, so life is busy. Um, unfortunately, the two wee ones have the lurgy, like a few of um, yeah, your congregation have here this morning. So unfortunately, Lois and Archie and Charlotte weren't able to come up with me this morning, but they do pass on their love uh, to you all. This morning, we're going to be looking in one of the Gospels, John's Gospel, chapter 4. And uh, a very, probably a very well-known passage. Some of you may know it very well, some of you may not. Um, but what I'll just do is I'll read through it uh, quickly. Now, we're not going to read through the whole chapter. It's quite long. We're just going to read up to verse 42. So John chapter 4, verses 1 to 42, and then we'll pray quickly, and then we'll get uh, stuck into the passage. So John 4, verse 1. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the, Lord, when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from all the journey, sat down by the well. It was about twelve noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will come in him, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages, even now he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I have sent you to reap what you have not worked, what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, 
and you have reaped the benefits of their labour. Many of the Samaritans from that time believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this really is the saviour of the world. Amen. Amen. So let's just have a quick word of prayer together. Father God, we give you thanks for your word, for your book. Lord, we, and says scripture tells us that it's God breathed. And Lord, we thank you for the vast amount of promises that it has for us as Christians, especially in this dark world that we live in, that the true promise of all is that your son, Jesus Christ, will one day come back to rule. And Lord, we thank you for this chapter now we're about to look in. We um, give thanks for, in a lot of ways, quite a simple story about this meeting between Jesus and the Samaritan women, Lord, but there's so much that we can learn from it this morning. So Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be evident in this room and that you would give us uh, listening ears, Lord, and soften our hardened hearts. And we ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Now you'll notice here that there are three talks taking place. At the beginning of the chapter, there is the talk of the town. In the middle of the chapter, there's the talk with the woman, which we're going to be focusing on mainly this morning. And later on in the chapter that we're not really going to have time to touch on is to talk amongst the disciples. But actually, before we get stuck into the chapter, it's very interesting. If you look back into chapter 3, um, we hear about Jesus' meeting with a Jewish uh, leader, ruler, called Nicodemus. And actually, this is what's so amazing about the Bible. Um, there are a few contrasts to take. Now, this is probably one of the most well-known verses in the Bible, John 3.16. But if we look at Nicodemus as a man, and as we look at the woman, um, there are just a few contrasts here that I'm going to point out to you, just to give you a bit of background. So Nicodemus was a Jew and a ruler in the Sanhedrin. The woman that we're learning about in chapter 4 was a Samaritan, and she was an adulterer. Nicodemus would have studied the law. The woman, however, well, she would have never formally have been taught the law. Nicodemus comes to Christ when it was fully dark. He met Christ in secret. The woman came to Christ at 12 noon when it was light. Nicodemus does not appear to hurry off and tell others what he had learned after speaking to Christ. However, you'll see in this chapter, the woman couldn't get going her legs. It's one of these cartoon characters and when the legs are going, they're not going anywhere. She couldn't wait to get back into the town to tell others about what she'd just heard. So that's just a, a few wee interesting points now as we start to look into chapter four. Now I'm a very simple person, I love my three points. Um, so we've got three points for you this morning and then a lesson and then just a very brief application uh, to end um, this sermon. So the three Ds I have for you are the diversion, the destination and the discussion. Um, the diversion, the destination points are very, very brief. Again, just to give you a bit of background, the discussion, however, that's what we we'll spend most of our time in. Uh, here. So first of all, the destination, or sorry, the diversion. So I think it's important that we look back to the very beginning of this chapter, and if you just look back at verse 3, it says, So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. <coughs> Now you'll notice here in verse 4 it says he had to go through Samaria. Now interestingly the shortest path to Galilee from Judea would have been through Samaria. However, most Jews would have chosen to detour around the east, avoiding Samaria. There is a reason for that which I'll come to later. Now in my job, uh, I work for a, a, a Christian firm in Edinburgh, William Purvis, who are a, uh, independent funeral directors and uh, we heavily rely on Google Maps. We use it most days to get around the city um, and uh, mainly for timings, you can't be late for funerals. Um, the great thing, even if you know the roads inside out, the great thing about Google Maps is it tells you the quickest route. Um, and sometimes the quickest route isn't the route that you think is going to be the quickest route because in Edinburgh there's roadworks, there's traffic, chaos, we don't really have rush at Russia and Edinburgh now is 9 to 5. Um, <laughs> So it's a very helpful tool to have. Now I always think if Jesus and his disciples had Google Maps, 
the first thing they would have punched into their phone was avoid Samaria. You just would have never have ever trekked through Samaria. However, there was a reason why Jesus went to Samaria. Firstly, thankfully he wasn't being led by Google Maps. He was being led by the Holy Spirit, but it's because he had to go meet one person, the woman. Now in Samaria, the religious capital temple was there, and it was erected for the god Baal, which you've all maybe heard of. Baal was a supreme god who the Samaritans worshipped. And sadly, for this reason, they rejected Christ. So Christ left them to their own devices, but not the needy woman. God had a plan for her which would change her eternal destination and many, many others. So the destination, just a wee geography lesson for you. The city of Samaria was located in central Israel, about 30 miles north of Jerusalem and about six miles northwest of Shechem. Now, Shechem was actually the first ever city mentioned in the Bible. It was the place where God made his covenant with Abraham. And Jacob's well was there. And the well, it was 105 foot deep and it was about seven and a half foot in diameter. Now, interestingly, Jacob means a cheat and a heel catcher. But as you might remember, um, earlier on in Genesis, God did something and changed his name to Israel, which means a prince of God. So what the Lord was doing with this well was using it as a visual aid for the women. And what's also amazing about this is God's timing was absolutely perfect. And we've got to remember that as we go through uh, this passage together. And later on in your passage, you'll see that God, or sorry, that Jesus stayed here for two days because the locals just could not get enough of him. So the discussion, this is what we'll be spending most of our time on. Actually, very interestingly, this is the longest conversation between Jesus and any person in any of the Gospels. And interestingly, it was with a woman, not just any woman, but a Samaritan woman. Now, earlier on in verse 7, you'll see that uh, Jesus asked for a drink. And what's important here to note is that this was Jesus in human form, just like we are here in this room this morning. He was hot. He was sweating, he was thirsty, he was tired, he was man. It's also important uh, that the woman was on her own at the well. Now this didn't happen very often, it was 12 noon, first of all. You would never usually go out into the midday sun in Samaria at 12 o'clock. The heat could be unbearable, heat that we can only dream of here in Kelty this morning. Also usually women would have gone together in pairs probably to catch up on the local gossip that was going on in the town. No doubt to moan about the husbands that hadn't been uh, lifting their finger in the house. But yet this woman was on her own. Why? Well, because she was embarrassed. She'd gone through five husbands and she was currently still living in adultery. No doubt she would have been talk of the town. No doubt people would have been making snide comments about her when they're in her presence. But look who was also on their own. Jesus was. Not one disciple was with him. When it been 12 noon, they'd gone off to the local deli to grab a bite to eat. But Jesus was on his own to meet the woman. And this was the very purpose of his journey. The conversation opens here that she couldn't believe that she was speaking in the presence of a Jew. It just didn't happen. Now, we history lesson for you. A thousand years before Christ, there was a fallout in the nation of Israel. And sadly, it was the cause of the, foolish, the foolishness of King David's grandson, Rehoboam, that you've probably all heard of. Sadly, this caused the nations to divide in two, and the ten northern tribes of Israel appointed their own king. The two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, stuck to Rehoboam as their king, and Jerusalem as their capital. And sadly, all the kings in the north were wicked. So the nation sinned to the extent that 700 years before Christ, the Assyrians came. Now, the Assyrians were a mighty empire who grew in what we would call a modern day Iraq. And you can actually read about this in Second Kings in, in your own time if you're interested. And the Assyrians came and took them away captive. A temple was built in Samaria and the 
the, the Jews later came and destroyed it. But sadly, this meant that the Samaritans worshipped God, but also false gods at the same time. And this is really the reason why Jews wouldn't want to travel through Samaria, in case they were contaminated. However, Jesus went into that area because of one needy woman. He asked her for a drink so, they, so, that, they, so that she may be saved eternally. Now you'll see in verse 10 that Jesus spoke about the living water. Now what is the living water? Now the living water, very simply, is receiving the Holy Spirit when we become believers. To become a believer, however, you have got to recognise something very important, something as Christians we do not like to recognise, something that we don't like to admit, and that is your sin, my sin. And so in verses 16 to 18, you'll read, he told her, go call your husband and come back. Can you see what Jesus is trying to do here? The woman replies, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now Jesus here is just making sure that the woman recognises her own sin because without her doing that she cannot come to know him as her personal saviour. And what he is very doing is just doing it step by step so that she is slowly coming to a place where she can be born again. Now, very interestingly, in verse 19, the woman raises a theological problem, a theological statement. She says, Sir, the woman said, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. And then into verse 20, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, this statement is to do with worship, the worship of our Father. The worship of our Lord Jesus. And then in verses uh, 21 to 22, Jesus says, You do not know what you're worshipping because salvation comes through Israel. It comes through the Jews. The Messiah would be of Jewish lineage, the Lord Jesus. And interestingly, in verse 23, the Lord gave a response. He said, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in the truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. Now what earth does Jesus mean when he says this? The Jews, and to a certain extent the Samaritans, were legalists, and sadly they thought they could gain heaven by low keeping. Sadly this is, was completely outward and impossible to attain. However, when God created man, he created him with a body that made him world conscious, a soul that made him self conscious, and a spirit that made him God conscious. As sinners, we are dead towards God, and we need new birth. And the Lord pointed out that, this is, that, that it is only by new birth through a new, renewed spirit that we can approach the holy God. Now actually my favourite part of this whole chapter is uh, in verses 25 and 26. Verses 25 says, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you, I am he. Do you know that's a point in the Bible, I don't know if any of you have a point in scripture, my favourite scriptures, where you would like to be a fly in the wall or an invisible shadow sitting somewhere just looking in, almost like a kind of film scene. Well, this is a part of the Bible I would love to be perched on the well, just listening into this conversation. When Jesus said to the woman, I am he, can you imagine a reaction? This is God's appointed Messiah that has come to bring salvation. Now as a husband, and I hope all you men agree with me with this, um, but I really like, uh, as a husband, as a man, um, I really like to think that I know all the answers to everything. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, whether it be about the Bible, science, 
history, whatever. My wife, our wee boy Archie, now is getting very inquisitive at that two-year-old stage. I sometimes just need to hand my hold, hold my hands up and say, I'm really sorry, I don't know, but let me go and find out for you. And that's a difficult thing to do as a man, isn't it? I hate, I don't, I don't enjoy it anyway, personally. But you know, folks, sadly, that is what we need to do in our Christian faith. We do not know, we are never going to know all the answers until Christ comes back. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just need to hold our hands up and say, I don't know, but God does. He is in control. And that's what's really interesting about here. The women, the women didn't know everything. But look how she responds. She literally ran off in excitement to tell others about this life-changing life conversation that she had with Jesus Christ. You can just see the joy in her face, can't you? She sat down with God, telling her those words that I am He. And you know, folks, what an example this is for us as Christians today. How many of you... When you leave your houses in the morning to go to work or uh, school or wherever you're going in the morning, feel like I'm going to run out of my front door and tell others about Jesus Christ, my Saviour. I can hold my hands up and admit that's not me on a Monday morning. So that's our three Ds, the diversion, the destination and the discussion. <coughs> you might be saying, well, Johnny, what can I learn from this, this, uh, this chapter, chapter four? Well, the lesson is, again, there's many lessons that we can get from it, but there's one simple lesson, and that is we have a gospel that is a whosoever gospel. It's for anybody and anyone. And, you know, this incident must have clearly had a remarkable influence on John, the writer. When John was an old man, he was on the island of Patmos for his faith. And the Lord gave him an incredible revelation of end time events, which we can read in Revelation. And the Lord asked John to write down everything that he saw. And in Revelation twenty two seventeen, it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. And you know, it seems here that the Lord took the pen from John and he wrote down these words. When John saw these words, no doubt he looked back at this very chapter that we're looking back and recognised that the water of life was for every lost sinner. And now the application. So I've given you three Ds, a lesson, and the application is the two Ws. Okay, so the two Ws witness and worship now i was living back home uh, which was a long time ago now it feels like um, me and my brother used to uh, go into we used to travel into school with my dad which was about seven miles from we used to live in town and uh, seven miles in edinburgh took sometimes an hour to travel as we've uh, talked on uh, earlier on with the rush hour and usually our uh, well first of all we were not a morning family my um we were usually hauled out of bed probably about 15 minutes before we had to leave. Um, usually didn't even have time to catch breakfast. And our car journeys usually consisted of dad driving, me in the passenger seat, my brother behind, and Radio 4 on in the background. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that we hardly spoke one word to each other until we got dropped off at the school gates. We were like rabbit in headlights, literally. And uh, the only point where my dad would speak was when he dropped us off at school and usually because i was in the front seat i used to get the slap on the leg and used to mutter these words to phil and i be a good witness and what my dad meant by that was don't just go into school and tell everyone about jesus christ which obviously was important but also what you do with your tongue what you do with your actions you know i remember at school um didn't drink alcohol and uh, it was it was noticed you know we're going on a night out and johnny isn't drinking why and that brought around opportunities to tell everybody well why i didn't drink and what my beliefs were about it and uh you know that's so important i don't think people realize sometimes as a christian people do pick up a lot on just what you say and what your actions are like in the workplace at home whatever Now, what's really important, again, just to touch on um, what I said earlier, is that the woman did not understand all the answers. She had this very brief conversation with Jesus, yet she hurried off into town. And, you know, 
the woman probably was still caught up a wee bit in her Samaritan the um, theology. However, this didn't stop her. This didn't stop her telling others. And do you know, anyone who knows Jesus, who's come to know him as their saviour, can be a witness. It's a difficult thing to do, but we have all been called the Great Commission in Matthew to go out and tell and call disciples to tell everybody about Jesus Christ. And you know, we must pray that God gives us these opportunities as well, and that we would be able to open um, people's eyes to the good news of Jesus. And our second W, worship, to be a good witness, we also must be a good worshipper. But we cannot be a good worshipper unless we are completely obedient to Christ. And do you know the amazing thing about worship is that it doesn't need to be done on a Sunday or only be done on a Sunday. It's very easy to come into church and then go about your daily routine Monday to Saturday. We can do it any time in any place. We can worship God in the car on the way to work or the way to the shops. We can worship God as we marvel around his beautiful creation, what he has made. We can worship God in our homes, in our workplaces. We can worship God in a restaurant as we give thanks for the good food that he has blessed us with. We can praise God in the good and blessed times, but we can also praise and worship him in the heartbreaking and painful times too. We can worship God at any time, in any place, no matter what is going on, because of who God has made us in Jesus Christ. And you know, worship of God, it really needs to start with truly knowing who he is. This is something, sadly, that the Samaritans lacked. But look, here was Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. And you know, Jesus didn't leave the woman in the passage ignorant of who God was or who the Messiah was. Jesus told her that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who would save her from her sins and enable her to be right with God so she could truly come to know and worship him. <coughs> and you know, you'll see later on in the passage that this decla declaration led to the woman's salvation, but also to many, many others in the town as well. You know, folks, praise God for Jesus' amazing grace and declaration to this woman so that she and her people could know God. Mm -hmm. And let's pray that all of us gathered here this morning, this would be the case. A quick question for you. Can you call Jesus your Messiah this morning? If you can, keep your eyes truly fixed on him. At our uh, home, my home church at Chalmers in Morningside in Edinburgh, uh, last year we were studying the book of Hebrews. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it talks about our faith race. And, you know, to run our faith race, we need a lot of things, but we need perseverance. And, you know, with perseverance, the only thing that we can do to persevere is to have our eyes truly fixed on Christ, as it says in chapter 12, because he is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. You know, we'll never know all the answers, as I've said, but just remember the biggest promise of all, that one day Christ will come back to reveal himself to us. You know, folks, I really cannot wait for heaven. If you can't call Jesus your Messiah, can I please urge you not to leave this building this morning without at least thinking about what he means to you. No doubt you've got questions. I'd be happy to speak to you at the end. Or maybe a person has brought you here this morning. I'm sure they would be happy to speak to you afterwards as well. Some great words to close um, from a hymn. Um, and then we'll pray and then that'll be us finished. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils his lovely face, I'll rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy day, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you so much uh, for your word and for what it has taught us here this morning. We thank you for this amazing chapter and we pray that we would use every opportunity that you give us to witness to those who we love around us. Father, we help us to be bold in our faith. Help us to be a shining light for you in such a dark world that we live in. Mm. And Lord, we pray that you would be with each and every one in this room this morning. Mm. Lord, be close to those especially who are struggling with ill health, maybe who have gone through a recent bereavement, or who are just going through a especially anxious time. Pray that you would be especially close to them. Comfort them, and may they remember that you love them and that you're holding their hand through this difficult mm. time. Lord, we also pray that you would help us to worship and to give thanks for all that you have done for us. Mm. Like the women in the passage, Lord, that we would take every opportunity that you give us to share your good news message. So, Lord, we do give thanks again for this time. Bless each and every one of us as we go out into a new week. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.